Innovation Scholarship in Education. Uh, the, the formal launch for Arise will happen on the 1st of October, um, and indeed that's when we plan to have the first of these public lectures. But the opportunity arose for us to host Professor Mitra, and as you'll see, that was a chance that was much too good for us to miss. Um, Professor Mitra is one of those people who uh, is a public intellectual that if you hear about his work um, from different perspectives, from different disciplinary perspectives, you assume that the name Sugata Mitra must be very common, and there are probably three or four different people <laughs> all working in these different fields at the top of their game. Um, he received a PhD in physics um, and went on using that physics skill to, to um, produce 25 patented inventions, many of them in the area of education. Uh, he's got an interest in energy, energy um, conserving and storage. Um, Professor Mitra has worked on, on battery design. Uh, he's had a hand in helping found the, the yellow pages industry um, in India and in Bangladesh. And he's also interested in the relationship between the structure of uh, molecules and their function. So a really uh, quite uh, humbling CV for the rest of us. Um, but probably what he's most famous for, um, and perhaps the reason he's here tonight, is the so-called hole-in-the-wall experiment. And in certain disciplines, in scientific disciplines, there are some, just a very few experiments, I think, that help shape and define those disciplines. So you can think of Milgram's experiments in social psychology and Pavlov's experiments in animal behaviour. And I wonder if, if the hole-in-the-wall experiments will do something similar um, for educational research. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Mitra here. Um, Professor Mitra is going to speak until about quarter past and we will have time for, for questions afterwards and some, some wine as well afterwards. So you're all very welcome to join us for that. So Professor Mitra, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it, it actually sounds uh, a lot bigger than, uh, <laughs> than it actually is. I think it's mostly a reflection of my age rather than anything else. As you get older, you do more things. So, you know, the list becomes longer. Um, uh, first of all, I have to apologize for my dress. And I must assure you that I have actually a suit in my bag. <laughs> it's just that I couldn't find a place to change it. Okay, it's a very nice suit and I look very seriously academic in it. <laughs> you just have to uh, you know, tolerate my, my traveling clothes. Um, uh, anyhow, um, so from physics, which is what I learned uh, as my professional, in my professional education, to uh, children. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's a long connection, but uh, I think an interesting one which uh, you would enjoy. So uh, we'll start off with talking about uh, schools actually. And uh, this is obviously a very familiar sight to everyone. Um, you notice something about it that um, if I have to date it and say when was this photo taken, it would have been anywhere in uh, the last uh, 300 years or so. Uh, in the last 300 years, and right up until today, you can still find and take a picture of a school that looks almost exactly like this. So, is that good or bad? Well, it obviously shows an efficient system, an efficiently engineered system, the fact that it survived or has survived for, for so long. Uh, what is it meant to do? Now, if it has survived for 300 years, we need to obviously take a quick look at the last 300 years and look at how the world actually operated. And uh, up until very, very recently, the world used to be run essentially by uh, large empires. 
you know, and then we all know about those, the Russian Empire, the, the French Empire, the Spanish Empire, and eventually the last of the lot, the British Empire. And uh, that age had its own method for how to administer vast areas uh, in the world. You obviously cannot, in an empire, administer using just the people whose empire it is, because you would have a problem with numbers. So you need to develop people in the places that you need to administer, and you need a system by which you would develop them, including, of course, the own homeland itself. So schooling um, produced effectively three kinds of people who were absolutely crucial to that time. The first of these were these people, and they were needed to, to defend, uh, to protect, and so on. What were the properties of these people? Well, first of all, they needed to be interchangeable. So they needed to be practically identical to each other. Secondly, they needed to be trained to obey orders without question. That was uh, required for the sake of efficient function. So whatever system produced these people would need to inculcate these two uh, properties. The other kind of people that schools needed to produce were these. The administrative machinery was run by people. People writing by hand uh, and, and doing many of the things which machines do today. Mainly because those machines did not exist. There were no telephones, there were no computers, and data was on paper moved by ships and road. Uh, you know, whatever form of transportation there, there were. So, here was a, a machine. In fact, even today, uh, it's frequently referred to as the administrative machine. So it was the attempt, and a brilliant attempt, to create a computing machine with people, pencils, and paper. And in order to produce that, you needed a certain kind of people. You needed them in very large numbers. These are the clerks. Now, what did they need to know? Well, firstly, a very practical piece of, uh, a, a practical skill, being able to write clearly by hand. Cursive, clear cursive writing, so that one person's writing could be read without error by another. They obviously needed to be able to read, and in order to do computation, they needed to be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide, or rather do arithmetic by hand, quickly and accurately. So the three pillars of elementary or primary education had to be reading, writing, and arithmetic. We kind of tend to take it as a, a given, but I think you may agree that they were necessary for that age, for that administrative machinery to actually operate. What does that mean in today's context is something that we might examine a little bit later. Again, uh, these people, if you notice, they work alone. They should be taught not to interfere with other people's work, nor to talk to them. A good, in a good office, that's what you would like to have. So you need an education system that will train people, to work diligently by themselves without referring to other people and without speaking too much. So that had to be a part of the education system. The third kind of people that were needed in that age were these people, the people who would make things. And the way of making things post the Industrial Revolution was of people who uh, should be able to do the same thing over and over again for about eight hours in a day. Uh, they needed to be trained to be able to do that. 
Their work had to be replicable. They had to be interchangeable on the assembly line or even across continents. And they needed not to ask questions. So again, these were qualities that the education system had to produce. So that kind of gives us a, an idea about why classrooms look the way they do in that first slide. They're a replica of the system that would run the rest of the world. A little replica that your child would go to for a number of years to prepare himself for that world. But then, around the 1950s, things started to change. <coughs> the, the tried and tested method of administering the world, which was the, the empire model, that got replaced by, uh, I mean, you may disagree with me, but by essentially experimental models. We're still experimenting with them, and we still say that there are problems, you know, there are problems with socialism, there are problems with democracy. We made that transition not too well. Um, we didn't change the education system at all, or almost at all. So, you had a system producing these people for a tried and tested way in which the world can be operated or administered, except that that world itself was undergoing change. According to me, the, the big changes, the first of the big changes, I think, was the telephone. Instantaneous communication uh, changes certain social structures. Just to give you an example, in a ship, if you need to, in a, in a ship with sails, there is a man who raises the topmost one. And he sits in this little bucket-like thing on the top of the mast somewhere. Um, he's, he's really too far away to shout at. So in order to give you an, an order to raise or lower the sail, the captain, who is the person beside him, has to have a number of intermediates to pass the order down. In other words, a chain of command, which would eventually make that guy do his job. You could do that with a mobile phone and take out the chain of command. The world wasn't even ready for that. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, grew up in a Jesuit school in Delhi, uh, very much a traditional school. So, it kind of hurts me to write that, but I think somebody had to. Uh, so I must make this point clear. I'm, I'm not saying that the, the model we are exiting from is a bad one. In fact, the opposite. I'm saying it's an extremely efficient one for its time. It's just it doesn't fit anymore. And if we can figure out that mistake, we could perhaps re-engineer what uh, education should be. So to do that, uh, we can use an analogy of, of, a, uh, of a fairly recent transition, less than 100 years ago. That transition was from this. This was the main uh, methods of transportation all over the world until, uh, I don't know, about 1900s or something like that, I guess. I don't know the exact date, but this is what it was. It had its entire... Uh, an entire engineering infrastructure that supported the production of these machines, uh, the upkeep of the horses, uh, their feeding, uh, etc. Almost every town uh, and every city uh, on these islands here uh, would have a place called the hay market. It was the, the gas station of its day, I guess. So there was this whole social structure of who would rear the horses, how would they be fed, What's the technology of the, of the bearings of that uh, vehicle? Uh, who would make the seats? Who would drive the whole thing, etc., etc. And then the internal combustion engine arrives. And the engineers say, we can take out the horses. 
and replace it with the internal combustion engine. Well, a welcome change. Uh, it's more predictable, it doesn't use an animal, uh, it'll go faster. But along with it comes a whole host of changes. The cobbled roads have to go because, you know, cars don't work too well on them. We have to have smooth tar roads. You can imagine what kind of a, uh, a huge decision that would be for a city council. Change all the roads or uh, put traffic signs and, and traffic lights and policemen and etc. etc. But one important change, the coachman. The coachman had to go. And surprisingly, the coachman got replaced, not by another profession. The coachman got replaced by the passengers. The passengers became the drivers. To me, that's a very deep change. Um, what does that mean in our context? Well, I mean, obviously I'm talking about education. Uh, can the passengers drive the vehicle? But the analogy actually doesn't stop there. Because big as that change might have been, there is a bigger one coming. From next year, as many of you would know, there will be vehicles in this country driving themselves. There will be few in number, there will be trials, but it's, it's inevitable that the, that the cars that drive themselves will replace the cars that are driven by people. Now this time, there is no profession being replaced. This time there is an idea being replaced. Because imagine a situation 30 years from now, when a child asks his grandfather, what does driving mean? Because he doesn't know what driving a car means. So what goes is not a person, but an idea of driving. So, we'll come back to that in, in a little while, that in the context of education, what could that mean? And it uh, is very fantastic. To, if I were to say it now, uh, you would find it scarcely believable, I think. So, hence this analogy to say, to say that it has happened before in another area. So, uh, how did I get into all of this? Well, purely accidentally, and a question which a lot of people asked me was, uh, why did you get into education? Well, the answer is accidentally. I used to write uh, computer programs, and I used to teach other people how to write computer programs and develop software applications. They were expensive courses, and uh, rich people's children used to take them. Um, this was in India, in Delhi. And right outside my very plush office, there was a, a slum, a big sprawling urban slum. So the thought did cross my mind that, am I not missing good software developers in that slum? Only because I wouldn't go and teach there. Nobody would pay me to do that. Or nobody would pay me as much as I was getting paid. And that was the case for many teachers uh, it continues to be the case for many uh, teachers of high-tech subjects, even today. And if you look around, it's not just high-tech subjects. It's actually true of teachers of any subject. Um, I have actually a paper, and I've measured it, but I won't go into that. i just leave you with a concluding statement from that paper, that there are places on the planet where, uh, due to whatever reason, good teachers either cannot or do not want to go. It's been that way and it will remain that way. So, what can we do about that? Because, ironically, the places where the teachers cannot get to are the places where they're needed the most. So, uh, is there anything we could do about that? Anyhow, back then in 1999, the internet was beginning to infiltrate into middle class life, you know, we were all beginning to fiddle around with email and things like that, desktop computers which used to cost a couple of months salary I think, uh, so you would buy one of those and uh, you would get it home, you, would, uh, you know, do your email on it, 
And you definitely didn't want any children playing around with that. Because, you know, this is way too expensive and you can't touch that. And so on. So that was the world of, well, not 99, but let's say 92, 93, something like that. Um, I uh, was curious to know what would happen if those children in that slum were exposed to this completely alien world of computers and the internet. Remember, it's 99, it's not today. Today it doesn't mean anything at all, but back then. So, uh, so I did this experiment, which the press actually called the hole in the wall, mainly because in order to give access to children in slums and villages, I had to put the computer into a wall, you know, to basically cut a hole in the wall, stick the computer into that. Um, essentially what it is, what you're looking at is, is a DIY ATM. You know, <laughs> I copied, I copied the model to the bank and it was about three feet off the ground. Now, whenever anything is three feet off the ground, the first people to come there are children. It's about their head height. So they came there and they said, what is it? Now, at that point, if, if I had to say, at what point did I enter education? That's the point I entered education when they said, what is it? The simple answer, it's a computer. But should I say that? Because if I did, then if this model was to be replicated in a million places on the planet, remote places, there would have to be a million persons who can say that's a computer. I didn't say it's a computer, therefore, because I felt that that's not going to solve any problem. What should I say? Well, I should say something which millions of people in the world are capable of saying very easily. So I said, I don't know. You, you admit that even in a very remote place, you, you won't find it difficult to get a person who would be able to say that. So uh, the children said they, they didn't, you know, they didn't uh, worry about that answer. I said I don't know. They said, can we touch it? So I said, well, it's on your side of the wall, so you can do what you like with it. And nothing much happened. That was uh, one of my learning moments. I stood there and I said, gosh, this is not going to work. This is just too alien. It's another world. So it, it might, might as well be an alien spaceship. I was utterly wrong. Nothing was happening because I was standing there. <laughs> I had to leave. Which I did. After a while, and according to my thinking, you know, it's because of me that they're not doing anything. I left. And four hours or five hours later, my colleagues came in and reported that the children were browsing. And they were teaching each other how to browse. And I said, but in, you know, what are they doing with the computer? Well, they're pointing, clicking, browsing, going, moving back and forth. Um, in what language? Well, obviously English, because everything was in English. But they don't know any English. So my colleague said, well, I don't know. Don't ask me all this. <laughs> they're browsing and they're teaching each other how to browse. Okay. Um, you today will, can immediately think of two-year-olds and tablets and realize that I, I was seeing the beginnings of that. But it was completely unknown at that time. So the newspapers lined it up. And the question they asked was, who got them? And I said, nobody. And they said, that's rubbish. <laughs> you, you're making it up to, to get yourself into the newspapers. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I repeated the experiment because one of the people there, one of the critics, said it's very simple. You run this fancy school uh, for computer development. One of his students was passing by and showed them how to use the mouse. So I said, yeah, well, that's possible. So I repeated the experiment about 300 miles away from Delhi in, the, in a really remote village where the chances of a passing software developer would be zero. <laughs> so, so in this place, there was no place to stay, so I came back. I went back after a couple of months and true enough, the children were playing games, painting pictures, doing all sorts of things. And the moment they saw me, they uh, said, uh, <laughs> my, my third learning experience, they said, we need a faster processor and a better mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, very matter of fact. So, 
<laughs> so I said, how do, you, how do you know all this? So then they said something which was even more curious for us as teachers. In a complaining voice, they said, you've given us a machine that works only in English. So we have to teach ourselves English in order to use it. So I said, but eight-year-olds are not supposed to do that. And did they teach themselves English? Well, no. It was very crude, very poor, but working in English. So I thought, well, I can get that kind of English just by putting a machine there. And not even a machine that's trying to teach them any English. It's just by being there that these children seem to have learned whatever smattering of English they had. By then, everybody was interested. So the World Bank gave me quite a bit of money. And they said, if what you're saying is right, then uh, this could be very fundamental to education. But you have to prove it. So it took me about five or six years, I think, to uh, repeat the experiment, to do a proper design, uh, get, you know, samples and controls and all of that stuff, and uh, to measure the whole process. So here's a quick look at those years. So this is the very first day, the first bit of footage we ever got. Uh, an eight-year-old boy on your right and his uh, student, who is six, uh, on his left, and he was teaching her how to browse in English. So, um, and then followed many, many other places of children downloading games, of installing software, doing all kinds of things. This one's a little boy there, telling his elder sister what to do. And this would happen many times at the hole in the wall. The younger they were, the quicker they seemed to be. Uh, we know that now because I know many 55-year-olds who, uh, when they have a problem with their tablet phones, go to, the, to a 9-year-old. <laughs> so, so we know that now, but I saw it first. <laughs> so I started measuring and publishing and doing all sorts of things. Um, mainly because once they've crossed that first stage, they've learned how to use the computer, they know how to browse. What do they do next? What happens next is, uh, and this is very important, I think, for everybody, not just poorer countries, richer countries. If you have a big screen like this one, and if it's shared by people, um, what happens is that you cannot do a number of things. You won't do Facebook on that. Because whose Facebook shall we do? If we were all working together, we wouldn't agree on that. You wouldn't do your email on that because everybody can see what you're doing. For some reason, we don't want other people to look at ourselves when we're emailing. Um, you know, it's just sort of human psychology. You can imagine, just imagine to yourself, you've got your laptop open and you're doing your email and somebody comes there is looking, you consider it very rude. So you wouldn't on a public screen do that. What would you do on a public screen like that? If you had a screen that size and uh, size and you had a few children around and say, okay, let me show you a nice website or let's look at a zoo or something like that. And that's exactly what was happening at the hole in the wall. By about four or five months down the line, the children began to search for things. They understood that even in their broken English, if they type something into the computer, the computer always has something to say. So um, they started typing all sorts of things. Uh, it, I don't know who discovered this, uh, a heroic little boy, somewhere I'm sure, or a little girl, who discovered that you can also type in your homework assignment <laughs> <laughs> and the computer has many things to say about it, which you can then copy down and take back to your teacher. When I saw that, then I thought, my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, this is not learning. And oh my goodness, gosh, what is this? I mean, this is not learning. Uh, we, we're all making a humongous mistake. I don't know why you made that mistake in 2003 or 4. When I was going through these bangs of, you know, this is wrong, I, I, I should tell them not to do that, and so on. Because I missed one very vital thing. I discovered that many years later in England, actually. 
Um, they will pop. The internet throws everything it has at them. They copy down. But they copy down only the relevant things. It took me years to understand that. I still haven't quite understood, and neither have my colleagues understood. We all know that they do this, but we don't know how they do it. And I have seen it everywhere. Uh, you know, from Aberdeen to, I don't know, to the bottom of the country. Everywhere, children behave that way. So anyhow, we published that children can learn things off the internet by themselves. And apparently, they're actually learning it. They're not just reading it. They can discern between what's right and what's wrong. Interestingly, that doesn't work unless they're in groups. And hopefully in many groups. And if they're allowed to talk, and I'm afraid, if there are no teachers around. <laughs> Only then does it happen. So um, I can say that now with confidence because I have many teacher friends who will back me up on this one. Okay, I tell you the context of that video. Uh, uh, well, first, let's check the sound. Nice to meet you. Yeah, that works fine. I tell you the context of that video. It was uh, one of the many experiments. Uh, this was done in the city uh, of Hyderabad, uh, down south in India. and. Uh, uh, in Hyderabad, like in many other cities in India, you have uh, little private schools, really cheap, but inexpensive private schools for poor people. The idea is that they can come to those schools and learn English. They advertise that learn how to speak in English, because that makes a huge difference to that lower middle class lifestyle if you know enough English. Now, the schools do a pretty good job, except that um, they teach them good grammar, good spelling, and so on. But the teachers who teach in those slum areas are all local speakers. The local language is a language called Telugu, which has a very strong accent. And if you think Geordie is bad, <laughs> go to Hyderabad. <laughs> so, so those poor children, what happens is that they come out of that school, but they don't get jobs because the interviewer says, you know, your English uh, appears to be pretty good, but I can't understand the word of what you're saying. <laughs> so that, that didn't help. So I went into one of the schools and did an experiment. I gave them a computer with a uh, speech to text program. And uh, turned it on and told the children, okay, go ahead and read something into that. So they read something into it and they started laughing. They said, oh, the computer's typing complete nonsense. It doesn't understand what what we are saying. So I said, okay, I'll leave this here for you for two months. You have to make yourselves understood. So the children then said, how? And remember my dilemma. If I say how, then there has to be a million people who can say how. Otherwise, it won't scale. So I said, I don't know. I said, I have no idea how you're going to do it. And anyway, I'm going away. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, we knew that that was a great stress buster, a statement from the teacher who said, I'm going away. <laughs> so, so, off I went and I came back after a couple of months and uh, their accent has changed sufficient. It's all documented. Um, how? So, what they done was they had downloaded something called the Speaking Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> When you type a word in, it speaks it out in a flat, neutral kind of accent. They would listen to the word, and they would say it, and they would keep correcting each other, saying, more stress here, more stress there, like that, until the computer got it right. Okay, brilliant. But what was stunning for me as a teacher was that the learners had invented the pedagogy. They're not supposed to do that. We are supposed to do that for them. So, how did they do that? And, and what an effective pedagogy it was. I wouldn't have thought of doing it better, but they did, and they changed their accents. So, uh, this piece is really to show a few of them practicing. Nice to meet you. 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 So, you know, different twists of the words until the computer would get it right. The young lady you saw in the last screen, there is a reason why I showed her, because uh, some of you may know her actually. She works for a call center in Hyderabad now, 
might have had a thing or two to say to you about your credit card bill. <laughs> Something like that, in a very clear English accent. <laughs> so, so, good for her. She just changed her whole life with that, uh, just the one thing, being able to speak English so that other people can understand. So, anyhow, uh, I came to England in 2006 with a uh, big research grant which Newcastle University had got for improving schooling in poorer areas of the world. Uh, actually, my colleague James Tooney got the grant and he said, look, you're the guy who should be doing this. So, that's how I got to Newcastle. Now, having come to Newcastle, I, uh, I was going around doing my work with Hyderabad and with, uh, you know, teaching quality in India and so on, until a local primary school teacher marched in one day and effectively said, what about us? <laughs> so I said, what do you mean, what about you? I mean, you've got these big schools, you've got everything you want under the sun. So she says, no, that's not the case. Come to my school. So she took me to the school. And I, you know, having come from India, I hadn't been to a, a school uh, in this country and I was, I really didn't know. And she took me to a school where, you know, a, a really uh, poor part of town in Gateshead. And I found many of the problems that I'd seen and I said, my God, but I've been wasting my time. These guys also need to, to do it differently. So, uh, so this teacher friend of mine, Emma and I, for the next few years, we uh, started experimenting. The first thing that uh, Emma started off with is to say, well, let's do the hole in the wall. And I said, uh, do the hole in the wall in Britain. You're going to get frozen children. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it here. It's <laughs> miserable weather. <laughs> you, know, you can't have this. So she said, no, you can't, uh, you can't say that. We're going to, so we, planned and plotted and we said, well, shall we put halogen lamps like they put outside pubs <laughs> things like that and finally gave up on all of that. And uh, we solved the problem by turning the hole in the wall inside out. So basically, we cleaned out the classroom, put in a couple of computers, drove in a whole bunch of eight and nine year old children and said, do what you like. The first thing the children said, why are there so few computers? So I said, well, that's the way it is. And like magic, the hole in the wall happened right there in Gateshead. And the teachers had the same thing to say as in India. How does it work? Because here, the children, they all speak English, they all read English. So I didn't have the problem I had in India. You could ask them really difficult questions and they would answer them. So the question that my colleagues raised in the university was, how far can we go? And they said, you can't go around claiming that children are, you know, doing higher mathematics by themselves. There has to be a limit. Since I didn't have an answer, I designed an experiment. And the experiment was carried out in southern India, in a little village called Kali Kuppam, uh, right down south of the tip of the peninsula. Kuppam had a few hole-in-the-wall computers from my earlier experiment, so the children knew how to use them. I made a research question. Um, I made a research question on biotechnology about 10 years ahead of that time. And I downloaded some amount of material from the internet. And I said to them, Can you answer this question? But they also didn't even un understand the question, leave alone finding the answer. But to cut the long story short, about three months' time, when I went back, the children said, We have understood nothing. So they were looking pretty glum about it. So then I said, well, how long did it take before you gave up? And they said, we, we didn't give up. And then one little girl raised her hand, 12 year old, and said, but apart from the fact that improper replication of the DNA molecule causes genetic disease, we've not actually understood anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so then, at that point in time, I understood that what we have hit on, hit upon, is a different mechanism of learning altogether. And, of course, I wanted to find out how it works. So, what it did at that time was that in Gateshead, we started creating what are called self-organized learning environments. It's a big name for a very simple idea. A few computers, broadband, big screens, big meaning, you know, screens like this at least. 
not not little tablets or notebooks, the big ones. A few of them, a scattering of children, a big question, and just leave them alone. They'll come back to you, and after a while, you ask them to report back what their findings are. What's a big question? Well, that's the tricky thing. If you take a dull and boring subject and you convert it into a big question, you, any teacher can do that. It takes a little bit of practice. For example, let's say that you want to, your lesson is on uh, how do human cells activate or deactivate. You know, like sometimes when you cry, there are certain cells doing things which they normally do. What makes, what turns them on, what turns them off. Now if you say all that to children, they are unlikely to be very interested in it. If you say I'm going to teach you cell expression, which is what it will say in the curriculum. But you could, for example, ask them, why does hair grow? So now you get a bit of silence. And then you say, you know what? I mean, it keeps growing longer and longer, and then you have to cut it off. All of us do that. Why would it do that? And why is it that the, the little hair on my hand, that doesn't do the same thing? Why is it that, uh, you know, a lion doesn't need a haircut <laughs> if it doesn't do? Now you've got them, okay? Everybody says, so what's the answer? So, that, so why, then why is it like that? And then I would go back to the hole in the wall and say, I have no idea. <laughs> and if you do it properly, you can make the question so that you can say that genuinely because I didn't have an idea. I know now because my year old taught me. <laughs> so you did them with that and they will do it. Their parents will report what's going on in school. The boy, you know, they, they're not talking about anything except self-expression. <laughs> you know, and they're doing this at home and they're doing it in the playground. And they, it's like that. You can actually do that and get that in the primary school. <laughs> So how far can it go? At the moment, I am left with no choice but to say, I don't know. It didn't stop anywhere, no matter how far I went. Including my, uh, my, my uh, rather interesting uh, experiment uh, of uh, uh, asking children what quantum entanglement means. <laughs> I mean, that's something you do in PhD in physics. And sort of a uh, 12 year old girl we say, you know, being in two places at the same time, you see when the, over, when the wave forms overlap each other and the probability condenses to two different points in space. She says, so I said, where did you get that from? Well, are you reading it off something? And she says, no, no, it's very simple, Sugata, it's just particle physics. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm running short now. The thing is that um, we know this, uh, what's happening today, that's on your left. Little children with tablets. Everybody has a story. I'm sure everyone in this room would have a story about little children with tablets. There's something happening there that we don't quite understand. We evolve. And we just, you know, we just keep looking. Uh, good example, my friend in Newcastle uh, with a, a child less than two years old, a daughter. She says, I'm walking with her and she looks at a stop sign and says, S-T-O-P, stop. So, so she's kind of, she's not supposed to be. So she kind of stops and the, she says, so what does it mean? And I said, what did your daughter say? She said, she looked at me and said, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what's happening out there. But we better understand it. Uh, what's the future thing? So, so you're going to, you send the guy to become a plumber somewhere. And he learns plumbing. But we are in a world where, He's going to encounter a man which he's never seen before. Because, you know, things change rapidly nowadays. He might find that there is no valve at all. But the water is coming and going according to some signal or whatever. So what can he do? Pull out a tablet. And better find that quickly enough so that he can do his job. That skill is neither taught nor tested by the education system. Which is a shame. Because in, in the times when you needed to know how to use triangles to map the country, the Victorians used to teach that in primary school. We, in the society where learning how to find things from the internet and use that knowledge immediately is critical to us, we don't teach it and we don't test it. We don't even let them bring it into the classroom. 
So, what happens to our three pivots? Sure, we need to read until your eyesight fails, then you can switch to the text to speech. You can have things, read out things to you. We have many, many options that our forefathers did not have. Writing by hand, cursive writing. Well, I don't know if you agree, but I think it should become a hobby, like knitting, for example. <laughs> <laughs> the the two-year-old today, what's she going to write? And how many of us write? Anymore. I, 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 if I had to write a four page letter by hand, my fingers start painting. And I've just lost it. We type all the time. Arithmetic, now that's the killer because that everybody's got a violently rejects. So the point is that if you just bought something for 69 pounds and have to pay 12.4% back on it, you were taught for 12 years how to do that by hand. Is there anybody in this country who would do that by hand in the supermarket? Not one. So what are those years for then? Oh, to get a deep understanding of multiplication. Is, is, that a, is that a vital piece of information that we need to know? Does the human race's survival depend on your knowing the 17 times tables? I don't think so. And as far as multiplication goes, there's 7 billion of us. No, I think we understand it instinctively. <laughs> So we've got to switch from answering questions which children can do by themselves to solving problems, which means making up the questions themselves, with the nice, interesting ones. And we need an encouraging adult. And there are many, many children in the world who don't have. So back in 2009, I created a, a thing called the Granny Club. I put out an appeal in the Guardian newspaper saying, if you're a British grandmother, if you have broadband and a webcam, can you give me one hour of your time per week for free? In the first two weeks, I got 200. I know more British grandmothers than anyone in this country. <laughs> <laughs> they form what's called the Granny Cloud. And the Granny Cloud can be beamed anywhere over Skype to any child to give that very vital piece of encouragement, not to teach, just that little piece of encouragement to say, you can do it. Wow, how did you do that? Excellent. Give it up, sir. Absolutely. Hello, I'm, I'm Tim. How are you? I'm all right. Have you heard of the uh, footballer called Wayne Rooney? Yes. What, what sort of bear does Wayne Rooney look like? A teddy bear. A teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of thing is not teaching and learning at all. It's about having a conversation, but it changes the English completely for one thing. So we put all this together into a self-organized learning environment, broadband, collaboration, encouragement. Easy enough to do in any school. This is what it looks like. One of the children ran his door in order. So, you got the idea. It's happening all over the world, actually, every continent now. And there are teachers experimenting with it, all of them getting those old experimental results over and over again, blogging about it, and so on. Um, so, what do we need right now? The problem is, that when you come close to the GCSE, teachers stop. And they've said this to me. So we have no choice. A year before GCSE, we have to stop all this. We have to tell the children, let's go back 100 years. Put away your computers. Put away the internet. Take out your notebooks. Do everything by hand. Memorize, etc. We have to change that end assessment. So... Um, I'll, I'll skip that one. Uh, you know, self-organizing methods are kind of being used in other areas as well. Uh, Mike Atherton recently wrote an article about cricket and how he actually named it and said maybe we should use the whole of the world to develop new techniques of bowling and things like that. 
Um, so in 2013, I got a prize from uh, Tech, uh, you know, the website Tech. So uh, using that prize money, what I'm doing is I am building seven, I have built actually five out of seven experimental schools. They're called schools in the cloud. Basically, they are souls and the granny cloud put together inside a highly visible environment. Remember visibility, public visibility is very important for this whole thing for, uh, for working with children. So this is uh, one of these in a place called Killingworth near Newcastle. Um, halfway around the world in New Delhi. Newton Highcliffe is in County Durham with a granny on the wall as you can see. Chandrakona is the other end of the world it's a, in India. Uh, all of them look the same. I like that. It, they don't have to look different for different uh, different groups of children, for poorer children, for richer children. They can look just the same. The computers don't care where they are. So unlike teachers who often cannot go to a remote place, computers don't care. The internet doesn't care. And it provides the same inputs everywhere. Over a three-year period, we will study what this does. From the Sundarbans in India to Killingworth in England. Across all the socio-economic uh, strata that we have in India, going up to urban middle-class India, in England, urban middle-class England. And uh, we'll see what is the change that we need to do to make the education system so that this could be the schooling that our kind of world needs. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. So we have a bit of time, but we have a few minutes for questions. So if, if anyone has questions, Professor Mitra, we have we have a few minutes. I'm uh, not from an educational background. Um, it strikes me people in perhaps policy or government are that generation X that failed to understand the possibility and the opportunity in the future of this generation Y technology. How are they convinced that this is something perhaps that educational systems require? Yeah, I mean, it's a deep question. It's, uh, uh, firstly, they find it very difficult, as you might imagine. Not always. I've been to the Department of Education down in London several times. And I must say, it's not as though they don't understand what I'm saying. They don't know what exactly to do about it. And I have a solution. So if there's anyone in this room who is willing to try this or, or help me to do this, I would be very grateful. I have a solution. I think it needs just four words to change the entire education system as it is right now. You, you take the GCSE, you take any question. For example, solve the following simultaneous equation. The typical GCSE question. I want to prefix it with four words. The four words are, use the internet to. Okay, now imagine a history exam or a math exam or any exam. The questions of this prefix, use the internet to describe the, the, the uh, civil war in early America. Now what happens? If you are a teacher, you have to change your teaching style completely. If you know that the student is going to have the internet in the examination hall, you will have to bring it into your classroom and you have to do similar exercises to what I just described. If you are the person who sets the question paper, you have to change yourself completely. Because there's no point making a question which, you know, Google will answer in two seconds. So you've got to make something better than that. If you, most importantly, if you are a parent, you're going to ask the school to teach children how to search properly. Instead of saying, I don't like this newfangled technology, you know, where is the proper schooling, the kind that I got 
Many, many, I have faced them in many, many countries. I'm doing perfectly fine. I have this kind of schooling. Why can't my child have the same kind of schooling? Because he's in another century. <laughs> so, so, we, so we, I, I think we can drive the system with those four words, but I need somebody to do it. Second is the work that's been done with small children, which the principals you're talking about here, would that work with adults, with young adults? Have you got any information on that? Yes, uh, I have sort of mixed uh, results on that quite recent results. Firstly, it does work with adults. I used to say it doesn't, but I was wrong. It does work with adults. The only thing is, adults are have these layers of, you know, decades of conditioning not to do it that way. So breaking through that is a lot more difficult with adults than it is with the children. But you can break through, for example, with undergrads. It's, it's a little bit easier than trying to do it with, uh, with sec company executives. But the irony is that solving problems together using the internet is what the industry wants you to do. And it's what school has taught you not to do. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a great big divide. So, uh, yes, the other thing I found, now this is a very mixed kind of uh, finding. I'm uh, quite astonished. Children at the fringe. I went to this uh, FE college in uh, Barking and Dagenham, uh, London, where even the school, uh, the college itself uh, describes the students as barely out of jail. <laughs> okay, so there they are, those grumpy 17 year olds. And they're being taught skills. So we, one of my students did an experiment. She took the scaffolding class. You know, we taught scaffolding by a scaffolding teacher. Very nice guy. He understood what we were talking about. We divided the class into two. To one half, we said, he's going to teach you scaffolding. Yeah, that's right. What else can we do anyway? <laughs> so, but to the other half of the class, we said, you have to build a two-story scaffold. And you can use YouTube. <laughs> you got a long story short. They photographed themselves on top of a two-story scaffold and put it up on Facebook. <laughs> In about two hours, like two or three hours. We asked the teacher, and the teacher said, yes, and they haven't done it exactly the way I would have done it. But they've done it. I mean, they're standing there. <laughs> so so uh, I don't know. I mean, it would be marvelous, actually, if that fringe adolescent crowd that we all are so worried about, you know, the deeps, not in education, not in employment, not in training, hanging about here and there, maybe they're the ones who will respond. If you give them the control and say, you do it, you go where you want. So, remember my driverless car? <laughs> Does this make um, teachers obsolete? Is there a place for teachers in everyone now? No, no I, I don't think we become obsolete, but we, our role changes very dramatically. And uh, teachers are kind of struggling all around the world to, to see how to make that change, which is their big, their question to me all the time is, how do you make up these questions? Okay, I don't have a method. It has to, I don't know how I do it. I mean, or, or how some of the other practitioners, there's some really good ones out there who build these wonderful questions. That's the art that needs to go into teacher training. How do you take a curriculum and convert it into a big question? Because we must, I think we lose sight of the fact that curriculum was developed because there were certain things that we need to know and we don't know them. So we build a curriculum trying to prepare people so that they can find them. We don't, we leave that big unanswered question out of the curriculum when you say you've got to learn trigonometry. Nobody wants to learn trigonometry. But you can get everybody to learn trigonometry with one question, which I did in China. The question was, how does your iPhone know where it is? <laughs> you say, I'm here, and the iPhone sort of goes like that, and tells you where it is. So you don't got to work, oh, so you have to GPS. So I said, well, GPS is just three letters, but what does it do? Well, it means three satellites. Why three? A little bit of muttered conversation, and I said, you know what? There's something called trigonometry. And then I, I'm holding my breath and I say, so do you want to know? And they say, yes. Because it's real. 
But we, we don't teach that. So those are some of the changes that teachers will have. One more question. Uh, I mean, with all the luck in the world, this would be a question we don't have to answer for that much longer. But um, what have you learned about breaking through conditioning with, you know, adults and, you know, undergrads? That's what Well, there is a good answer and a bad answer. The bad answer came to me from the United States, guess what? <laughs> the bad answer was... It will take only 15 years. I said, why? He said, they will die. I love those Americans. The good answer is that, yes, you can decondition. We are all getting deconditioned. Have you run into this situation where uh, you said, you know, what should I, what should I put into my pot roast? Something like that. And then I said, okay, man, I'm going to call Mary, and uh, or, or uh, something like that. Or, uh, let me look up my cookbook. Uh, and then after a long, long time, <laughs> you open your computer. And, and then you say, and of course the computer immediately gives you the answer. And then you say, but well, why didn't I think of that before? We are in that stage. The children are not. They, they go first to the computer. I, there was a recent newspaper article saying they're not asking questions anymore to their parents and teachers. They're asking the internet first. I think we'll make that transition and, you know, hopefully, and hopefully we'll not have to wait for the American solution. <laughs> well, we're, we're out of time, I'm afraid. I hope some of you can join us for a glass of wine or something soft afterwards. Um, I'd also like to remind you um, and welcome you to the next lecture in this series, which is on the 1st of October. Um, but most importantly, could we express our thanks to Professor Leach?